Hi everyone, welcome to the 8th from the Shack. It definitely feels as though the barbecue season is alive and kicking, even though the weather's been a bit strange. But Elkie, how are you and what have you been cooking? I'm good, cheers, mate. Yeah, the weather has been a bit strange, isn't it? I mean, the sun will be shining, but it'll be freezing cold, and then it's snowing, then it's raining, then it's sunny again. So, yeah, it's been a mixed bag, but I'm lucky enough to have the shack. Last weekend, had a bit of a pizza fest. A um, few pizzas that weren't for the purists, I have to admit. I did a pork and Thai basil pizza with a Penang curry sauce, which is epic. And I did a lamb kofta pizza as well with a spicy burnt chilli sauce and some saffron mayo on it. So, definitely not for the purists, but they were bloody tasty. Now, what about you, mate? What have you been up to? I have to say, Elkie, those pizzas sound amazing. We've been cooking lots, and I think my favourite has to be a beef joint that we cooked last weekend. Now, let's take a look at what's coming up in today's show. Coming up, Elkie likes nothing more than a dirty tomahawk steak, and today he hasn't got one, he's got two amazing steaks to cook over fire. Neil adds a new twist to a lamb tagine dish and gets to make his first chicken burger on the show. Our special guest is creator of the Rockbox portable pizza oven, Tom Gosney. And Tom is going to tell us all about his latest creation that launched recently. And we take a look at what the barbecue community has been up to in What's Cooking. Welcome to From the Shack. We've got a lot coming up in today's show. But first of all, Elke, we need to celebrate an anniversary. We do indeed. Yes, mate. Happy anniversary. 12 months now we've been producing content together and it's been one hell of a ride, isn't it? I mean, 20 lockdown barbecue shows in 20 weeks, which itself was a challenge, but absolutely fantastic to do. And now, of course, we've got From the Shack. This is episode eight. You can catch all the previous lockdown barbecue shows on my YouTube channel and, of course, catch up with From the Shack. So that's the Smoking Out YouTube channel. So go and check them out. It's been an absolutely brilliant year and it's been fantastic to talk to so many barbecue legends. Now, talking of legends, I think your film for this show is going to be legendary and remembered for a long time. Let's take a look. This is a tomahawk steak from Philip Warren Butchers, and it is an absolute beast. In my opinion, there aren't many things better than one of these. Unless, of course, there's two of these. Two tomahawk steaks. They're going to go on the rotisserie. They're going to be spun over some fire. It's going to be bloody delicious. So let's get these rubbed up and get them fed onto the spit. <laughs> Oh yes, I've never been so excited about steak. Just look at these beauties loaded onto the spit. So we're gonna go over, get our fire lit. I'm gonna spin these over the fire until they hit an internal temperature of about 49, 50 degrees. Then I'm gonna take them off the heat. We're gonna let them rest. And while they're resting, we're gonna get a nice cold bed on the go to finish these off with a dirty sear. Let's get over there and crack on. So these tomahawks have been spinning for about 45 minutes now. They look absolutely incredible. The thermal pen's telling me they're 48, 49 degrees. So I'm get, gonna get them off and I'm gonna rest them. Oh, if you can see these steaks, let's, let's just get in and have a look. There they are. There they are. Oh, honestly, I've been sitting here just watching this the whole way, just drooling wait until they come back round. Here they come. Here they come. <laughs> I mean, have a look at them. So like I said, it's time to get these off. Let them rest. Ready for the dirty sear. Oh yes.
to slice like butter. It looks like butter. I mean, that is as juicy a steak as you are gonna get. This looks epic, it smells epic. Two tomahawks cooked over fire. Seared dirty with a dirty baste. I am a happy man. That was one hell of a cook. But what rub did you use on those steaks? Mate, I really enjoyed that one. Those tomahawks were immense. And the rub was actually uh, Jess Piles, hardcore carnivore black rub. But you can see there that I've taken influences from elsewhere. The good thing about barbecue is you spot things elsewhere and you kind of put a little bit into your food and you start to create food based on these other influences. Now, I see Captain Ron from the States spin two tomahawks over fire and I thought I've got to have a go on that. And then you can see the obvious influence from Marcus Bowden there with a dirty sear and a dirty baste. And yeah, they were absolutely immense. And Neil, let's take a look at what you've been cooking, mate. In today's outdoor living, I'm going to create two tasty cooks on my Kamado Joe Classic 2. The first is a chicken breast wrapped in Parma ham burger with grilled pineapple, and the second is a lamb tagine with a bit of a twist to it. Weird weather over the past couple of weeks, but we are starting to see life in the veg patch. The radishes and spinach are doing well, and the lettuce seedlings have just started to come through. Because of potential frosts, we still haven't planted out the seedlings that were growing indoors, and they're looking pretty leggy. For lunch today, I'm going to make chicken burgers for my wife and I. If you'd like to have a go at making these, you'll need four pieces of parma ham, two skinless chicken breasts, one baby gem lettuce, and two burger buns. Additionally, you'll need a medium pineapple, a tablespoon of demerara sugar, and a teaspoon of ground black pepper. I'm also making a tangy dressing for the burger, and for this, you'll need three tablespoons of mayonnaise, one tablespoon of tomato ketchup, one tablespoon of horseradish, one teaspoon of pepper sauce, a tablespoon of Worcestershire sauce, and one grated shallot. Give it a good mix and it's done. Lay up two slices of palm ham next to each other and place the chicken breast on top and wrap. To prepare the pineapple, slice away the skin and cut out two rings, sprinkling each side with sugar and pepper. When the KJ reaches a temperature of 200 degrees C, you're good to go. Place the chicken breast over the direct heat and cook for around 10 minutes on each side. Then I move them to the indirect side and continue to cook until they reach an internal temperature of around 75 degrees C or so. A Fermapen probe is a cracking bit of kit for checking this. Cook the pineapple rings for two minutes on each side and toast to the buns for a few seconds. To build the burger, add the lettuce, pineapple, dressing, chicken breast, more dressing, then the lid and you're done. This creation was super tasty. The pineapple definitely added a new dimension. Maybe next time we'll go for smaller chicken breasts or larger buns, who knows? My second cook has a Moroccan feel to it and it's a lamb tagine. The word tagine refers to a succulent, stew-like dish, which is slow cooked in traditional cookware. Typically a tagine is a rich mixture of meat, poultry or fish and usually includes vegetables or fruit. Mine's going to be different because I'm cooking the lamb separately and serving it as kebabs with a rich tagine sauce and lemon couscous. To make this you'll need a kilo of diced lamb, I got mine from my local butcher. You'll need 400 grams of chickpeas, two chopped onions, one carrot, 400 grams of chopped tomatoes, two garlic cloves, one tablespoon of tomato puree, 130 grams of dried apricots, 250 millilitres of chicken stock, salt and pepper, and 100 millilitres of olive oil for the marinade. The spices you'll need are two teaspoons of ground cinnamon, cumin and turmeric, and one teaspoon of ginger. Mix the spices together and divide into two. Mix one half of the spices with the olive oil to make a marinade for the lamb. Add the marinade to the lamb and give it a good mix, and put it in the fridge for a couple of hours. Place a cast iron frying pan on the KJ grate and heat a little cooking oil. 
Fry the onions and carrots for about six minutes until softened. Add the garlic and remaining spices and cook for a couple of minutes. Add the chicken stock, tomato puree, chopped tomatoes, season with salt and pepper and cook for a further 20 minutes. Finally, add the chickpeas and dried apricots to the sauce and cook for another 10 minutes. Take the sauce off the barbecue and keep warm. Now for my favourite bit. I love cooking kebabs. Cook the lamb over direct heat and turn on a regular basis. They should be done after about 10 minutes or so. To guarantee they are done to how you like them, check the internal temperature with your probe. At a temperature of around 60 degrees C, they are cooked to medium. Serve the lamb kebab with a tagine sauce and couscous. It's delicious. Now, if you're looking to up your barbecue game this summer, check out the Barbecue Barn website or visit one of their shops. They'll be able to give you lots of great advice on top tips on which barbecue kit is right for you. Elkie, I loved both those cooks. It just shows what you can achieve on a Kamado Joe. Mate, they look great. I was literally drooling looking at that. And yeah, it just goes to show how versatile the Kamado Joes are. I mean, you can take any cuisine, any dish, and it can handle it no problem. I mean, it's not just about typical barbecue food. It can do everything else as well. Absolutely. Now, Elkie, would you like to introduce our special guest? Yes, yeah, so our special guest today is a bit of a legend with an amazing story to tell. He's a global entrepreneur and he's the inventor of the Rockbox portable pizza oven. It's Tom Gosney. Tom, welcome to the show. You're well known for being the founder, product inventor and CEO of your brand, Gosney, and your Rockbox has been a global success. Is it true that you got the idea for the business after building a pizza oven in your garden? That is correct, yeah. Um, so I, I built what was a monstrosity of a hand-built brick oven in my garden um, after cooking pizzas one evening for, for my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. Um, I decided the next morning that I would build a pizza oven in the garden. Well, I decided that night after I got soggy pizzas out of the conventional oven in the kitchen that I wanted to build a pizza oven and the rest is history. The story behind it is incredible and especially um, when you come up with a rock box. Um, can you tell us about the way that came about and, and kind of how you funded the um, the whole project? It was interesting. I, I started off by, you know, I, I was hand building brick ovens when I originally, when we got into it. So I built one in my back garden. All my friends started requesting me build them for them. And and that was really where the idea for the company was born. Then like the first first ever product that we developed was um, was called the Primo oven, which was a, a sort of mini concrete igloo. I spent six months researching refractories and, and how, to, how to make a pizza oven. And then I got a five grand loan from my mum. Two grand of it went on a mold, a fiberglass mold to cast a, a like a little concrete igloo, which made our first ever pizza oven. That was under a brand called the Stone Bake Oven Company. And then the other, the other two and a half grand was sort of spent on uh, a website and that was the beginning of the business. And so we launched, the Stone Bake Oven Company was officially launched in 2011. Um, we, we made a range of like traditional premium um, wood-fired ovens for, for, for sort of kit use for home gardens. And that was really, you know, that, that was a slow start, but sort of like I taught, I was self-taught how to make products, how to like market a business, how to build a brand, all that stuff. You know, when typical grassroots founder story where you just do everything right, spare bedroom, get everything done. And like, uh, like completely wet behind the ears, a real lack of any experience, but just keen as mustard to succeed and and hard working and so we launched the stone bake oven company then 2013 we launched our, our range of professional ovens i just saw an opportunity in the market as well to launch a range of professional ovens so we came out with a with a patented fast assembly installation kit for like much larger wood-fired ovens and when we launched that in sort of 2013 slash 14 it just did exceptionally well. We had high quality DEFRA exempt ovens in the UK market that we could now install really easily. And so we landed brands like Frank Amanka, Pizza Pilgrims, those guys. And then whilst we were doing that, I saw an opportunity to develop a product that we could scale overseas. You know, the Stonebake Oven Company ovens, whilst they were affordable and great ovens, they were 150 kilograms and shipping them into Europe or anywhere else was really cost prohibitive. And so it was really, the idea was born out of wanting to have the efficiency and the performance of a stone oven, but you could ship it in a box with like DPD anywhere in Europe for a tenner. And, and that was where the concept for Rockbox was born. And um, that was in like 
sort of end of 2012, 2013, the concept was born. And then we spent two, two and a half to three years developing the technology for it to work and actually perform like a bigger stone oven. Obviously, big stone ovens have thermal mass. They absorb loads of heat from a fire, re-radiate that heat. So making something that had to be sort of sub 25 kilograms work in the same way as their bigger brothers was, was quite a challenge. And that's why it took us some time to get it developed. Well, you've definitely done a good job of it. I mean, I've got one of the rock boxes and love it. I mean, cooking a pizza in 90 seconds is, is, is fantastic. But you, I kind of, as a few years ago, I see these rock boxes start popping up. And then before you know it, 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 it looked like it just went crazy. I mean, there's, you know, there's rock boxes everywhere. It seems to be like a bit of a whirlwind. Yeah, it's been, it's been great, man. It's been awesome. So we launched in 2016. Um, you know, we, we bootstrapped the business, man. We had no external funding. So we, we you know, we, we decided to launch on Indiegogo, which is like Kickstarter for the people that don't know. And so it's like what you basically do is you give a discount to a consumer to be able to purchase the product, but they have to wait a period of time because they're essentially helping you fund it. So we designed it. We got it all completely tooled and we've got manufacturing partners on standby, but we just couldn't afford to order the volume of stock that we were ordering. It was like minimum order was like, 250,000 pounds. And so as a small business, we can do it. So we went live on Indiegogo to launch it. And uh, it just kicked off, man. It was crazy. It was great. You know, we had sub 5k marketing budget. I, you know, I'm like a marketeer at heart. It's why I, I love selling and I love interacting and networking with people. So I, uh, we joined a competition called Pitch to Rich, which was Richard Branson's first ever like Dragon's Den style competition that he launched. We, we joined up with that. And then I created a, a couple of interesting press releases like uh, Rock Boxes After Richard's Dough and all of that stuff. And we just got a couple of press releases out like that. And just, you know, like some of the national papers just, just grabbed onto it. And it sort of like snowballed a little bit, not massively, but a little bit like Daily Mail, Daily Mail started writing about Rock Box completely unprompted. It was like they, they just, you know, they, they, they just really enjoyed the product. And so we, we got a good bit of PR and then when we had a countdown to launch, you know, we'd got sort of two and a half thousand people on a database that were interested in purchasing. And uh, and we launched and we converted half of them, half of the people on the list. So we 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 had a hundred thousand dollar funding target, which we which we had to achieve in a month. And we actually achieved it in something like I think it was like seven hours, something like that. So it was like and then we were at. We, we hit 600,000 in sales within four days of running the campaign. It was crazy, man. I tell you what, for a little business owner and like someone that's just like so wet behind the ears, so ambitious, really want to like share wood fired cooking with the world. Um, it was like a Euro Millions lottery win, right? Like having a funding program like that it was insane, man. You launch it and the product that you've obsessed over for three years, blood, sweat and tears and all of that jazz. We had to work so hard to get it out because it was like so expensive, so difficult to design. And so when you see it get that traction, it was it was incredible, man. It was such an achievement for the business and it was a real turning point for, for the company's future. Uh, it, it is an amazing story. And, and you talk about being a marketeer at heart. Um, you've got some, Gosling, you've got some really sexy marketing material, I've got to say, but you've also got a, you've got a YouTube channel with some great content yeah. on. And uh, I think uh, Chris Roberts did the uh, Cubanos pizzas. He's quality, he's superb. Um, you've also had James Golden, a uh, friend of the show, who did yeah. some uh, a pheasant, was it? Yeah, J James has done a few things for us, man. He's again just an absolutely brilliant chef, man. And you know, back to uh, James was James was one of the first guys I met. We installed our first ever commercial oven at the Pig in Brockenhurst, and so like that was where we that was where we sort of like broke the back of the commercial scene and got an oven in the Pig, and that helped us generate um, additional PR. And you know, we landed different people like River Cottage after that. So the Pig was a big. Pig was a big part of our journey, you know, and so lot, lots of love for the guys at the Pig and James. What's your favourite thing to cook outside? You know, that's a really difficult, like, I'm going to spin that round and ask you the same things. I bet you can't give me a direct answer. It, it's, it all depends on the situation, on, the, on, on you know, whether you've got totally. people around, whether it's for a group. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one to answer, and that's why we're asking you. I will tell you the seasons that I've gone through with my favourite thing for that moment, and there's been many of them, like pizza... Pizza was obviously a thing that I got into and I got behind, got really, really fat doing it, but like loved it, right? Like the mastery of the dough and like trying to make a fermented dough and like getting that better spring, like the crust rise and all of that stuff was incredible. So like got fully obsessed with dough. 
like really loved when we, when we had the bigger ovens um, in in Stone Bay. When I had one of those in the garden, we, you know, I used to cook whole pigs, whole lambs, and that was like an entertainment piece. That was fun. Got obsessed with making brisket in the wood fired oven for ages, doing brisket rolls for God knows how long. Um, I don't know. Like it's really, really, really like now. Like uh, probably is still my obsession. Right, is to like make an incredible dough. Like I currently make a 96 hour fermented high hydration dough, which I'm like geeking out about, right? Like I geek out about it and like nurturing the process of constructing that dough and then baking it at like, you know, 450 degrees and getting these like insanely fat crusts that are hollow with a little bit of chew, leopard spots, nice and crispy. That's like, that's like making art, right? Like that's how I feel about it. So I'm like, I've, I've got to say I'm obsessed with pizza, man. Like I'm obsessed with it. I just shouldn't eat it as much as I do. Can you tell us about the design rules that you follow when you design an oven? One of the key things for us driving, um, driving that business forwards and being successful with that business is making products that truly, truly work brilliantly, reliable, high quality, that perform. And, you know, we wouldn't supply the amount of pizzerias that we do with our professional ovens if, if we didn't follow that ethos. But there's a few things for me. So it's like... We never, we never really cut corners on cost. We build in brilliant features for the consumer. We're a sort of consumer-led design brand. We want people to have the best experience. And that doesn't always give us the best, you know, like the cheapest price in the market. But like, I'm not, I'm not necessarily focused on that. And I, you know, similar to how Steve Jobs approached designing products for Apple, right? It's like they want to have the best possible product. And then similar to Dyson as well, build the best product with the best engineering and then price it with your margin on top and 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 get behind selling it. And so it's not completely black and white. There are gray areas in between that, right? But I suppose the ethos that I follow, I'm like really, really big on creative design, like industrial design. I love beautiful things, right? I've always appreciated beautiful design ever since I was a kid. And so like one aspect, it has to be visually very appealing for me in order to be able to build it and design it. Um, it has to be exceptionally high quality, so it's going to be durable enough to last, so we can charge the money that we're charging for it and have a good reputation as a brand. And then it just has to work incredibly well. So I would say performance, quality and aesthetics uh, are, are the core things. And, you know, like within performance, I suppose, a sort of, a, you know, a pillar, if you like, when we design is actually building in things like insulation and and truly engineering flames to be the right distance away from the food makes it easier for the for the person to use the product and so like overall customer experience i think when using our products is really important as well if you burn everything or it's like undercooked and burn it's shit right so it's like it has to work so i you know performance and efficiency which which delivers ease of use for the consumer a beautiful product and just a durable, long-lasting product. Those are the, those are the key things. And my 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 CFO hits me with a stick daily for wanting to have all of those things because we design products that are really bloody expensive to make and more expensive to sell. But that's just the nature of what we do. Well, talking about beautiful products, um, that leads us nicely onto the dome. I mean, it looks absolutely incredible. Tell us a bit more about the dome. Oh man, the dome is like the dome has been my love affair for the last three years. You know, when I went on a quest to design Rockbox in in two thousand and thirteen, it was this. It was the same thing. You know, I, I truly believed when I designed Rockbox that we could build a category out of portable stone ovens, and uh, and that's what's happened, right? Like stone ovens didn't exist in in portable stone ovens didn't exist, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago, and so. I was always excited about building a category with Rockbox and, and, you know, we, we have been a large contributing factor to doing that, you know, and then the dome is the same, man. It's like, it's just, it's just, a, it's a different product from anything that's out there. You know, it's like, it's, so firstly, talking about the pillars of, of design that I've just talked about visually, I think it's beautiful. It's an in sort of interpretation of everything that I find beautiful about products in our sector so the thing that I truly love about it and the, the, the sort of disruptive juxtaposition that I feel that Gosney has, or, or I certainly try to design to, is having, a, having the heritage of a Neapolitan oven, right? Which is this big giant oven that sits in a pizzeria with big cast iron, cast iron bay on the front of it. And like, we've, we've pulled in the aesthetic from the heritage of like Neapolitan ovens and created this 
almost like sort of professional oven aesthetic, but for a consumer. And so that for me, firstly, I think I, you know, this is a sort of direct representation of my taste and what I love in the way the dome looks. Um, and then, and then the features that it has are like unparalleled, right? And so it's built to an incredibly high standard, incredibly durable. It's got, you know, like a, a, a ceramic bonded paint over the entire product. So it's like incredibly durable to the elements. Um, very thick stone floor, bags of insulation. So it just stays hot for absolutely ages, right? So you can do a whole different array of cooking techniques within the product. But then it's also got the actual tangible features as well. Outside of the quality and the efficiencies of its performance, it's got an inbuilt steam injector for making sourdough bread. You know, it's got a vented door. It's got the docking system that the oven looks like it sits on, but it's all one product. Within that, we have an accessory port that you can bolt different things into the product. And, you know, wood, gas, it's got little features like an interchangeable stone puck. So when you choose between wood or gas, you can change the stone puck over so you never lose floor space. It's just a beautifully, beautifully well considered and well thought out product that I think is going to, I think it's going to do really, really well. Now, Tom, what advice would you give to anybody who's thinking about starting a business? Oh, that's a really, you know, it's a really good question. Um, don't let people like cynical shit people in this country knock your confidence. You know, like the amount of times where I've been told on my journey and by no means I've made it right. I've built a company that is, 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 is successful in its own right. And, you know, we've got big ambitions. I'm not going to pretend that we haven't been successful because the, the products and the brand is, is in an amazing place. And I'm really, really proud of that. And that's partly down to, to vision, great product design, but also a brilliant team of people that actually make that happen on a day to day. Right. If I could count the amount of times that people have told me that, why the fuck are you making a pizza oven? No one's going to buy a pizza oven. Who cares about making a pizza? Why would anyone spend a thousand pounds on a product where you can buy 800 dominoes for the same cost of building an oven? You know, like all this crap that you get told. And like, I don't know, I think, I think there's like quite a cynical mindset in this country to some extent where people, people don't want to see people succeed, man. And I think it's such a shame. It's, you know, it's slightly different in the U S you know, people celebrate victories a little bit more, but I suppose, I've always just had a mindset that no one is ever going to step in my way. You know, I, I came from uh, like a past of not really having any prospects. You know, I didn't do well in school. I was booted out of all the schools I went to. I've got no qualifications. And I was always told I would get nowhere in life. Right. And so I had I had like a excuse the pun, but a burning fire within me anyway to go and, you know, prove people wrong. And I suppose now that's like morphed into a desire to build something that I can be proud of that like makes me feel like I've reached my potential as an individual, um, you know, cause I'm a hardworking, ambitious person. Um, I suppose like not letting cynics get you down, um, trusting your instinct as well. Instinct is a big thing. You know, I, I've made a lot of decisions um, throughout the course of my growth of the brand based on my instinct. And when I stopped listening to them, it didn't work quite as well. You know, you listen to outsiders, but it's a really difficult balance because you've also, if you're like relatively inexperienced, you need to take advice from people. And so uh, I suppose um, never getting deflated or derailed. You know, if, I, if I'd if i felt when times got tough, man, if I threw the towel in, I'd have thrown them in sort of seven times year one, 12 times year two, so on and so forth. Do you, know, do you get what I'm saying? So you've got to be resilient, hardworking and just have a confident can do attitude to be able to make it right. And don't, don't let anyone like deflate you or pull you down is what I would say. Yeah. Great advice. Now, Tom, your products are sold all over the world. Are there any sort of territories out there that you've been surprised at how successful they've been in? Um, yeah. So like we, you know, we, we have been successful globally. We're, we're not in, we, you know, we're not everywhere. We sort of blanket sell to Europe at the moment. We don't have any like, native advertising in a European country. So we're not advertising in German yet, in Germany. Um, but we've had great success in Europe, even though we're not native. Australia's been good. We sell in Australia, America, Canada, Europe, and UK. Um, UK is, has been incredible, but we're based here, right? And so it's easier to get swell in PR, um, especially when we've got a professional oven business here as well. Canada absolutely flies for us. You know, it's a relatively small market, and it absolutely hammers, but I suppose, Markets that we're not in, where we've got people bashing down the doors, Latin America, like those guys cannot get enough of our products. They, people are flying in, right, from like 
Argentina, Chile, getting rock boxes delivered to the US and then they're taking their rock boxes back on their flights and they're literally flying into the country to take them back down there. It's crazy. And so my, my, my Insta, my DMs get blown up about Latin America like constantly. So that's an interesting one. Although we've got our work cut out with our territories that are in front of us right now that we're actively in before we start trying to bite off more. Um, so I think that that's quite interesting. Middle East as well, you know, like Dubai and lots of places like that. They, you know, they there's there's people knocking on our door from from that area as well. But but you know, like I said, guys, we've got our we've got our work cut out um, selling where we're selling already. You you mentioned Canada. Um, uh, one of my food heroes, Matty Madison. Um, I see yeah. he did stuff with you um, a, a year or two back, didn't he? Um, We'd absolutely love to get him on the show. So if you want to have a word of him, that'd be great. <laughs> but, but, um, what, Mate, he's an, exp- like? he's, an, he's, he's an expensive and a hard man to tie down now. And he's like, he's, um, he's, he's, he's a real friend of mine and a friend of the brand. And, um, you know, he's, he's an incredible, incredible guy, man. He's dealt with some real adversity throughout the course of his, his career and his life. But, you know, I think there's going to be some interesting things to come from Matty with us, you know, we've got some, we've got some stuff in the pipeline with, with him. He's a great dude. Tom, can you get us into any secrets about what your next design project might be? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I can't. I'm not saying anything. Like everyone at work will beat me up. Um, no, we just got, we, you know, we, we love innovate. All I would say is like, we love innovation. Um, we never sit on our hands we're always going to surprise the market with what we come out with next. You know, we, we don't, we don't look to bring products out quick and fast. We like to engineer products to work brilliantly and bring like highly disruptive products to the market. And so expect more disruptive products, but maybe not anytime soon. (laughs) Tom, thank you for being a brilliant guest on the show and good luck with the Gosney Dome. Thanks man. Nice one, bud. Cheers Tom. Much appreciated, mate. All right, chaps. Nice one. (laughs) Elkie, Gosney is such an incredible business and Tom is such an inspirational person. Oh, he absolutely is. What an inspirational person and what a story to tell. I mean, to have that many setbacks as well and to go on to achieve what he's achieved is nothing short of incredible. It's absolutely brilliant. Now, if you would like to catch up on some of our other special guests that we've interviewed on the shows, you can find them all on the Smoking Elk YouTube channel. Now it's time to find out what you've been cooking in What's Cooking. Another set of amazing barbecue photographs, but which was your favourite? Yeah, the bar just gets set higher and higher each time, doesn't it? But I'm going to go ahead and pick smoky maple meats. Now, there's a thing on Alton's Barbecue World called the Mask Griller, where all these cooks submitted their cooks, and it was kind of done blind, so nobody knew who had cooked each dish. And it's Italian week, and I believe uh, Aston, his name is, he cooked, a, he cooked a burger, but it was a waffle burger. It's like an Italian burger. But the waffles were made of spaghetti, uh, and then he had the burger, he had the tomato sauce. He had all the elements in there to make this burger. It's just incredible. Um, and the best thing is he's only just turned 14. It was an amazing cook, LP. Now, that's about it for this show. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. And a big thank you to our programme sponsor, Commando Joe, and our feature sponsors, Fermapen, Barbecue Barn, and Philip Warren Butchers. We'll see you next time. Yeah, and as always, a huge thanks for me, guys. Keep those fires burning, and we'll see you next time.